Well, good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, welcome to Q&A night two and also our final session, uh, final Q&A session for KBBC 2023, Building God's Kingdom After Exile. Uh, we are very glad uh, to have uh, Dr. Richard Platt back with us yeah, to respond to some questions. And we have some interesting questions tonight, Richard. Yeah, so we'll kick off with the easiest well, of the lot. Okay, let's do it. Son of Malam. Malam, Malam, Makan, Malam. Makan, Makan, Malam. We ask them Sudan Makan. Makan. Not the Makan, Makan. Okay. Okay, we'll go right to the first question. Yep. Uh, can we have the question on the screen? <laughs> okay. So, Richard, last night you mentioned from the passage in 2 Chronicles about fasting as an going on, uh, doing battle, yep, as a sign of uh, being serious about doing battle. So, one, our first question tonight asks Can you please expound more on the theology of fasting and how it affects our prayers? So, I'm assuming that uh, the questioner would like us to think not just on one passage but a little bit more uh, in, in the light of what the entire Bible has to say about this particular yeah, topic. Great. So why, what is fasting? Why should we do it? That's sort of the question, yes? Okay, so it's a good question, and it's a hard one. And there are books out there, um, one in English, by an old book by Samuel Rutherford on fasting. That's a good book. Um, it's, it's, um, there's not a lot of information in the Bible about why people should fast, but there are examples of different sorts of situations where they do. I will just remind you, and you can find out where by looking in your own Bible, because I don't know where, it's New Testament. I don't know where anything is in the New Testament. Okay? But don't worry, you're only a page or two away. Just open it up. It's such a little thing, you can find it in five minutes. Um, and that is that, remember, Jesus is scolded once um, for, the fact, by the, for the fact that his disciples were not fasting, that they were having a party all the time. They were happy all the time. And Jesus' answer was, well, so long as the party's on, the bridegroom is here, they're not going to be uh, fasting. But once he goes, meaning once I go, and once I leave them, they'll start fasting. It was the expectation of our Lord that we would fast. Say, so yes, I got it. Okay, so that's a, good, that's a good place to start there. Fasting is not usually the kind of thing you do when you are celebrating, when good things have happened and you are delighted and you're trying to honor God for his great blessing in your life. But rather, fasting is something that you do in the Bible in two instances primarily, but they are, one, when you have sorrow over your sins, and that your sins are so great that a simple, I'm sorry, Jesus, is not enough. Now, this, is, this may trouble some of you because some of you may have been taught that all sins are equally egregious to God. That's, that is not in the Bible. In fact, it's, as this young man will tell you, um, that is simply not the case. Some, some sins are um, more... Uh, egregious or serious in the eyes of God than others, okay? That's not to tell you that you should just do the little ones and not worry about it, but it is to say that when you fall into serious sin, that one of the things you do to show your repentance is, you do, to the sincerity of your repentance, the intensity of your grief over your sins is to fast before the Lord. That's one, okay? Another one is, is that when you need something from God, and it's a very big thing that you need, and you need it desperately. Uh, this is something that when people need these things, they, they fast in order to demonstrate their heart desires that they need it, and they know they need it. And so rather than simply casually saying to God, please take care of this problem, they devote themselves to the Lord, by removing themselves from the ordinary things of life. Does that make sense to you? I mean, if, if, you know, I have things in my life that I pray about every single day, 
Um, but there are times when my sense of how important they are and how much I need God to move in those areas of my life and the lives of people that I love very much will lead me into fasting. So um, I think that's a very important thing for us all to know and for us all to do. And that is another reason why there's a third one I should add. And that is that when you're preparing yourself for some special service to God, not getting up in the morning and going to work like you do every day. But when there's something special about to happen, like when Jesus was beginning his ministry, he devoted himself to fasting because it's a way in which you symbolize your consecration to a special task. You do all in the Bible, you do all, and they did all kinds of things to make that symbolically real for them. And unfortunately, sometimes um, you may you may find yourself thinking that well you know I'm I'm cl I'm close to Jesus all the time I don't really need to do that well okay if you're close that close to Jesus all the time then hooray for you but I think that normally what we realize in our lives is that our relationships with people our relationship with Jesus our relationship with God kind of goes up and down and it's there's more intensity and there's less intensity to those re those times when we are having interaction with God. And when you want to have more intensity and you want to demonstrate that you are committing yourself in a special way to a task that's before you, then one of the things you do is you fast. And that involves, not in Jesus' case, but in ours, repentance over sin, asking for help. So it combines the other two that I mentioned. No, thanks, Richard. Yeah, that certainly, uh I think for maybe some of us here, it's something that we don't really think much about. Yeah. Uh, certainly among my circle, I think usually fasting happens when people do it for health reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, but this got absolutely nothing to do with health. I haven't been doing enough of that recently, okay? <laughs> but uh, perhaps if, if we can probe this a little bit more, because uh, I wonder whether what you just mentioned may have perhaps open up some kind of wounds for some people. Uh, for example, do these spiritual disciplines like fasting, uh, does it actually draw us closer to God? Or how does it actually affect in terms of our sense of where we are in terms of our relationship with God? Especially as Christians, we are no longer in the Old Testament, no longer under the law. How, how do we discern whether some of these practices described in the Old Testament uh, how whether it's still applicable yeah, for the yeah. church in the New Testament. Yeah, we are not under yeah. the condemnation of the law anymore. That's that mm -hmm. is certainly true. That's why I started off by saying that Jesus said his disciples would fast once he left. Mm. Okay? So um, this is what is expected of us. And fasting is the way you show your need for God it's the way you show your devotion to God, your sorrow over your sins. These are the kinds of things that people did in the Old Testament that Jesus affirmed in the New Testament, if you need for him to do that. He did affirm it. You shouldn't need of him to do that, by the way. But nevertheless, if you did, if you do, then you got it. He says, my disciples will fast once I'm gone, because while I'm here with them, this is the happy time. And they're about to start going through the hard times. I mean, wouldn't you fast if you thought your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your child was about to be martyred and you did not want them to be martyred? Would you not fast for them to be delivered? And some of you, you know, this is one of the problems we have actually with intense prayer is that we don't know how to demonstrate the intensity of our prayers. And so and our need for God. And so what we end up doing is just sort of saying, well, I'm showing a lack of faith if I ask for it more than once. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say that. And, and I go, brother, this is, you need this. You want this. He wants you to show him how much you need this and want this. He really does want you to do that. Um, I think, did I not mention about the two mothers who agreed to pray for their children, fast for their children once a week? That kind yeah. of thing, you know, that just demonstrates, Lord, I'm taking this seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Certainly, that's something for us to consider. Why uh, perhaps we may exclude that 
as something that we do uh, uh, and whether it's something that we can certainly exercise as Christians who are free, uh, not because we have to, but for the reasons that you just mentioned. Yeah. Now, if you were to say that, that might be different. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. quite the way I put it, but it's fine. Yeah, but uh, yeah, because uh, I guess, but feel free to comment because uh, I'm, I'm just mindful that uh, we are so prone to start to do things as if they somehow will improve our standing with God and by I'm a more spiritual Christian if I do these things. That seems to be so prone in, in how we think. So that's why I'm, I'm just thinking that even as we think about fasting, which is something which you certainly have reminded us, there are very, very good reasons why Christians should practice them, but in a way how to still guard against that kind of thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll move on to uh, next question. Uh, next question concerns uh, actually how we teach and preach Chronicles. And this is actually, uh, yeah. So the question goes like this. Would you preach through Chronicles chapter by chapter? How do you preach about a king pointing to Jesus without sounding the same in most sermons? <laughs> that last part's a good question. How do you preach about one king after another after another without just always saying, well, Jesus fulfills that. Next sermon, Jesus fulfills that too. Next sermon, yeah, Jesus fulfills that too. Um, okay, well, I am not, there are lots, excuse me, there are lots of people that do believe that you, it is required of Christian preachers that they march through books of the Bible verse by verse and that this is somehow God's favorite way for you to preach the Bible. It's okay with me if you want to do that. That's fine. I think it's a le perfectly legitimate thing, but it is a difficult thing to do. And I don't think it's required. Now, why do I believe that? It's because we don't have one example of anybody in the New Testament doing that. Okay? And uh, that should let us know that it's not a norm that we have to observe. Now, if, if your church tradition or your ch local church thinks that this is really the only way you can keep yourself on track is by going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, fine, that's okay. Um, but I do believe that while we are to preach the word and only the word, that does not, that's not the same as saying that every part of the Bible is designed to be preached. Can you hear the difference there? If all preaching is to be from the Bible, it doesn't mean that all of the Bible is for preaching. Those are two very different things, and it sort of depends on what you think preaching is designed to do, what you think God wants preaching to be. And um, some parts of the Bible are extremely difficult to preach in a public setting where you have different ages of people, you have different genders, you have different um, uh, classes of people in the same setting. It's a very difficult thing to do because parts of the Bible are more oriented toward this and more oriented toward that. Some parts of the Bible are very adult. Yes? Okay, I don't know what the ratings of your movies are in Malaysia, okay? But the high ratings, okay? And, um, we, and so... We ignore them. Yeah, you, don't, you don't even know, do you? You're so innocent. You don't even know those classifications, okay? Um, but they're very adult and sort of adults-only stories. Because remember, these stories are written for the leaders, adult leaders of Israel. They're not written for children to pick up and read in a comic book. They are adult stories. And for you to preach certain parts of the Old Testament for uh, two children would be like what you do in Sunday school or your church school, your children's program. You sort of boil it down to something that's childlike. Yes, do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? Okay, so I think it's much more appropriate given the ways in which people in the Bible 
in the New Testament handled the Old Testament and how Old Testament preachers handled the Old Testament for us to, or like Nehemiah, people like that, is, is to ask more often the question from the Lord, and you might even fast about this, okay? Ask the Lord and try to seek to understand what do my people need from you? And let that control you more than we are used to allowing that to control us as we go to the Bible. Because while there's value in the breadth, exposure to the breadth of the Bible, Sunday morning is a time when you are really proclaiming the word of God to his people. You're, you're being prophetic. You are saying to them, thus says the Lord to you today. And that means that you really do have to concentrate on what people, what you as pastor or leader or teacher, uh, believe that the God, that these people need from the Lord in that time. So, for example, when I come to a thing like this, I mean, do you, do you have the sense that I have memorized my sermons and that I just sort of say the same thing everywhere I go? Do you think that's true? I hope you don't think that's true. They're not written down, and I haven't, don't have a brain that can memorize these things. I have basic ideas, but I am, I am coming to this very weak and very much dependent on the Lord leading me on what I need to say about the plethora of things that could be said from this passage to you. Now, Andrew and I go around quite a bit together. Andrew, I, when, you've heard me speak on a number of these passages that, that we've done here, okay? Um, but do I say the same thing every time you've ever heard me preach on a passage? No. no. Always different. Always different. <laughs> okay, it's always different. Not radically different, but different. And the reason for that is because I'm looking at you. Uh, someone said, why did you walk around the first night? trying to shake everybody's hand. They asked, that, they asked me, because I did, and they asked me, are you just friendly? I said, are you kidding me? Me, friendly? Okay, <laughs> no, okay. But the, can you guess now why I did that that first night? That's right. I needed, I, needed to, I needed to figure out who's here. Does that make sense? And that, that controls a lot of what, by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit's leading, what I'm wanting to preach. Otherwise, I'm just preaching to myself, and that is not what I need to do. And so there's value in going through large pieces of the Bible, but um, you would have a hard time making a lot in a sermon out of the genealogies in the first nine chapters of First Chronicles. It's not impossible, but you, you'd be hard-pressed to do that. Thank you, thank you. I think sometimes we forget that uh, actually the Bible doesn't have chapters and verses yeah. uh, originally, and yet somehow we are so confined to chapters and verses That's these right. days. That's very true, very true. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Perhaps if we can take it to a slightly different context from preaching, say I think many of us uh, here are families, uh, perhaps like in the context of a, a family devotion. Yes. Um, do you have any suggestions like how, how should we like handle chronicles in a, in a setting of a family devotions? Do we read from chapters 1 to 2 and by the time we reach chapter 4 in First Chronicles, we might feel a little bit discouraged in our family setting. Yeah, I mean, this is a great <laughs> example. If you're, using, if you're going into the Bible like the book of Chronicles or practically any other book, uh, my number one advice to any family that has young children that's wanting to establish the practice of daily worship together, my number one suggestion to you is keep it short. Because if you keep it short, you can do it even if you come home very late at night. You can say, okay, it's time to have our family worship now. Now, short is different for different people. For my wife and me, it meant 12 minutes. I don't know why 12, but 12. <laughs> that was it. Okay, that was it. Because it's more important for your children to know this is important to my family. This is the rhythm of my life. We are not going to have a day together in which we do not have family worship together. 
and you can do it if it's if you've you know you've gone on a you've gone to dinner at someone's home and you stay too late and you get back at 11 o'clock at night and your five-year-old sleeps in the car you can wake them up we got 12 minutes to go here boy let's do it and you can do it for the shorter period of time so that's my biggest advice my other advice to you is that um, that you read, um, that means you've got to read little pieces of the Bible. So be sure you read the Bible in a way that um, you can get enough out of it in a short read to be able to have something to say. And I would encourage you to say something, that you're more or less like a preacher rather than just read it and now let's pray and go to bed. Because I think this is just advice, okay? There's nothing in the Bible that tells you what you need to do. Well, there's a little bit about teaching your children, you know, all over the place, that kind of thing. But it's, it's, it's just my advice to you. Thank you. 12 minutes a day is better, better than uh, uh, not having it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Um, still on the topic of teaching and preaching chronicles, the next question, um, in a sermon... Is it advisable to compare the character, say, David to Jesus in each of the main points of the sermon, uh, etc., et practical, ex for example, practical wisdom, sacrificial leadership, okay. every point go to Jesus, every point go to Jesus? That's a great question. Uh, do you, you always have to take everything you ever say about a passage and make it somehow refer explicitly to Christ? That's the sort of question. Or can you simply go from a character in a story and draw out moral advice or advice of faith or advice of doctrine and that kind of thing? Um, you know, I, I do believe that for a Christian that every encounter with the Bible, we ought to desire to have an encounter with Jesus himself. We ought, I think that I don't know how you would think otherwise. Um, but when in Luke 24, you know, this is the famous passage for, you know, finding Christ everywhere in the Bible. It's Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus, right? Um, and it says that he showed them, um, how's it put it? He showed them the Christ in all of the scriptures or something to that effect, right? I don't believe that that means that he went through every single verse or sentence in the Bible and said, do you see? Next sentence, do you see? The next sentence, do you see me yet? Okay? But rather that, this, that Jesus is anticipated in all of the Bible from Genesis to Malachi. He's anticipated throughout it. And that there are things in there that weave us and point us toward him. And you need to be um, very aware that it does happen. And you need to know that Jesus is the one who ultimately will bring the blessings of God, and he's also the one who ultimately will bring the curses of God to his people. Um, he is the one who enforces the kingship of God the Father throughout the earth. He's the one who um, defines and refines and aligns the, the standards of human loyalty. These are the elements of covenant life with God of God's benevolence is our, our required of our loyalty from us and blessings and curses. Jesus is the one who manages these things. He is the king. He's the vice regent of God. He's the, represent, he's the royal representative of the great king, the father. And so, um, so he does this. And um, you can, there are all kinds of ways to go at this and to sort of have a system for doing this in your own head. But... Um, I think that at times we might tend to overdo it. Have you ever been in a sermon where the pastor says to you, this is, this is fulfilled, there's the slippery word, fulfilled by Jesus. And you go, you're listening to him and you're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, but you say, you may see that pastor, I just don't see it. Okay. Well, sometimes we have so much drive to find a connection to Jesus in small pieces of the Bible that we sometimes overread it. And it's sort of like you get the pot of gold if you find him. You know, G you know Joseph wore sandals. Jesus did too. Can't you see it? Okay, that kind of thing. 
So just be careful about that and use the New Testament as your guide for the ways in which this can be done on a practical basis. So there's nothing wrong with saying Solomon went to the temple. He was the king. Jesus is the king of the great temple too, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also nothing wrong with saying things like um, Solomon had idols. You shouldn't have idols in your life. That's not wrong either. Look at the way the New Testament handles the old, and you'll find that they do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? You'll find that New Testament writers do just that. They will draw moral, moral, moral um, advice and moral um, insights from things that happen in the Old Testament as well as theological ones. And they don't always talk about how Jesus, and I put the word quotes here, fulfilled, because that's a slippery word. We use that very loosely, that Jesus fulfilled it. But on the whole, you've got to do that. You want to bring it into Christ and how the end times that are in Christ from his birth all the way to his second coming, that this age, in this age, we relate all that we do to our King Jesus. You, that is something you do want to say. Or we believe all we do, all we say to Jesus. Yeah, the, uh, the verse in Luke 24, verse uh, 27 reads, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to the disciples what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. See, all the scriptures is not the same as saying every single tidbit of the scriptures, every phrase, every sentence, every verse. You get the difference? Okay? The whole Old Testament is anticipating what Jesus would do. There's no doubt about that. From Moses all the way through. By the way, they also anticipate what Holy Spirit would do. Ding, ding. So just, you know, hold on to your, hold on to finding Christ in the Bible. That's fine. I remember the first book I ever read of this. What was the example that they used? that it sort of blew my mind, and I was probably in high school or just had become a Christian, and it was something really obscure, and this man said, you see, this is a picture of Christ, and I just looked and said, and I remember my wife and I were doing this in our family devotions, and I just said, okay, I just, I, I don't see it, but I guess it must be true, because he said it in the book, and, but you have to have the authors of the Old Testament saying things about that world of the Bible, his history, that actually do point to Jesus rather than just an accidental similarity. This is a whole evening of talking about it. The next question actually kind of also addressed something similar. Uh, how can we teach or preach from Bible stories without coming across simply as let's try to emulate, for example, David or Jesus? Great. Yeah. That's a good one. Whew. <laughs> so it's coming from the other end, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so coming like from the other angle, the other side. Um, how can we read Old Testament Bible narratives or stories without simply saying, he did a bad thing, don't you do bad things. He did a good thing, you do good things. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, good. That's, that's I think, more or less the question, right? Okay, and um, well, you can do that by enriching your sense and your understanding of why something would have been considered good back then, back then, okay, back then, okay? and why something would be considered good now. Because these things, 
events and things that people choose to do, both good and bad, are sort of wrapped up like a Christmas present. There, there are beliefs and ideas surrounding them that make them good or make them bad. Did that just communicate what I just said there? And it's the wrapping around the event that gives them their significance. Yes or no? Okay, you're going to go home. You're going to drive home tonight in a car probably. That event can be either a good event or a bad event. Yes? You can drive your car in a morally good way. You can drive your car in a morally evil way. Okay? It's not the driving of the car in isolation from other things. It's the car connected to other things that are wrapped around it. Like what? Well, you see someone in the road and you decide you don't like people standing in the road, so you run over the person. You just made it a bad event. You follow what I'm saying? So you have to look or you, you're driving down the road and you see somebody in the middle of the road and you, and you put on your brakes and you stop and you wait for them to get across the road. You just, didn't, you just turn driving home into a good event. It's the same kind of thing in the Bible. People do all kinds of things. They'll eat, they'll sleep, they'll walk, they'll run, they'll fight, they'll laugh, they'll do all kinds of things. And those events in and of themselves only have their moral quality as God looks at them in association with their motives, with the standards of his law, and the action worked together. And uh, the standards, the goals, and the motives of the, of the event or the act. And so you have to evaluate every single piece of the moral potentials of the Old Testament in terms of the standard of God's word, the motivations that the person has, and the goals or the impacts of what the person did. And that is right there in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. And, this, and then you adjust that properly for how the standards uh, in the New Testament times have been given to us and how the goals and the motives, or the motives and the goals of the New Testament are there. So, you know, if, for example, if you, um, if you give a poor person um, money, you might say, well, that's a good act. Yes, but if you do it to make everybody around you think you're a really special person and you're taking great pride in it, you've just turned something that could have been good into something that's bad. Does that make sense? That's for your motives. So Jesus is all about motives, but so is Moses. They're about, mo they're about motives, not just what you're doing, giving the money, but your motivation for doing it. So if you think that you're pleasing to God simply because you're doing the right thing, you need to also evaluate, why am I doing it? And what's the goal that is being reached in doing it? So, it's, so it gets to be a lovely, wonderful um, experience then to humbly before God, do your service to God. And um, yeah, so I think that's a, a lovely thing to do. So you can do that in the Bible, but you have to wrap these, imp these particular things you see there, you have to wrap them with what the Bible wraps them in, which is, which is all the other, the standards of God's word, the motivations of the heart, and the impacts or goals of the actions that you take. Oh, that's too complicated, wasn't it? But that, that doesn't sound easy at all, does it? Standard, goal, <laughs> motive. You can memorize that, right? There's a standard I'm trying to fulfill. That's the rule. There's a motive of my heart. Okay, do all, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for what? The glory of God. That's your motive. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes? So whatever you do, that's what you're doing, and there are certain standards about that. Paul wasn't meaning, Paul didn't mean there, murder somebody, do it for the glory of God, it's perfectly fine. Right? He's saying, now look, you've got some things in your life, a bunch of things in your life, and if you want to know how to do those things well, then do it for the glory of God. There's your motive. And, um, and you also want to ask the question, of course, does it, does it in fact bring glory to God when you do it? Or is your, well, your motivation might be good, but did you, after doing it, go, whoops, 
So, yeah, so that's the way the Bible works, and it's a wonderful thing. It does give you a lot of freedom, and it gives you the ability also to allow other people to make different choices than yours because of their motives and their goals. Standard, what are the three things anytime you're thinking about a moral or ethical decision? Standard, the rule, the goal, and the motive. Does Jesus want you simply to go through the rituals of doing the right thing? What do you think? Does Jesus simply want you to go through the motions of doing the right thing? No. He wants you to be motivated properly, yes? And does Jesus want you to be motivated and do something? And does he want you to do it again if you notice that, whoops, it really doesn't have the right as a result? Yes or no? No. He wants you to back up and say, well, wait a minute. Maybe I didn't get it right. That's, that's, that's Bible ethics right there. Standard goal motive. Yeah, lot to think think about. Uh, me, uh, uh, just a quick follow on question to that, and I think yeah. with that we will close for for tonight. Um, the Old Testament uh, having commandments, then there are also stories and history. So, um, in what ways can the interaction between the commandments and good. the stories help one. us cl clarify that's a, these that's things. That's a for great us. one. Yeah. But yeah, because think about it, think about it this way. If if you're reading a story, a story that was written after God had given his law on Mount Sinai, if you're reading one of those stories, and that means all of them, okay, because Moses wrote about Adam and Abraham after Mount Sinai, okay? So God gives his law, and then you get these stories of events. Well, how did Bible writers evaluate whether an event or an action was good or bad? What was their standard? What was their primary standard? Can you tell me? It was Moses. If Moses did, if Moses approved of it, it was a good thing. So you're reading through, and you see that they're doing something, and Wow, they did what Moses said, so okay, it was a good thing. Um, later on, God revealed more through especially David, and so when you're reading the book of Kings or the book of Chronicles, you'll find that kings' lives and actions are evaluated by saying he obeyed the law and David. Okay? In other words, the prophecies and the Psalms of David, that kind of thing. And so these become the standards by which the writers themselves evaluated what was going on in the book. If we took our modern standards, even Christian modern standards, but let's just say, well, let's stick with Christian modern standards. If we took our modern standards of Christianity from the New Testament and we took them back to the Old Testament stories, a lot of the things that they did, we would say today, I'm not really sure I should do those things. How about, like, I'm going to win the cause of Jesus by, by um, killing wicked people? Would that be one that happens in the Old Testament? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Okay, the conquest of Canaan. Well, does, does the fact that the Old Testament says that that was a good thing, and it does, but according to the law of Moses, it says that, does that mean now that you should feel obligated to go out and kill people in order to spread the kingdom of Jesus? Yes or no? No, because the standards by God's grace and by his revelation have been adjusted for the what his strategy is for now. It's different now than it was back then. Not deeply, but it's on, and on the level of actions. Because remember now, the way we serve God in the conquest of the world is to seek to rescue people, not to destroy them that's different Jesus delayed the destruction until the second coming oh yeah okay so 
You do have to ask what's the standard that Bible writers are using as they write their stories to figure out whether they're telling you this was a good thing or a bad thing. And just because somebody did it, even your favorite person in the Bible, just because they did it doesn't mean it's always necessarily a good thing. Does that help? Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry for making it so obscure tonight, but I tried. No, um, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think rather you have given us an insight. Uh, sometimes, because when we hear you preach, for example, we, we may think, oh, this is quite simple, quite straightforward. But you just help us actually realize uh, to preach uh, a sermon that sounds simple and straightforward, actually there's a lot of homework that has to be done to wrestle through all these issues. Uh, and, in, and in order to arrive at sometimes the thing that you share with us, like even uh, like the sermon that we look forward to hear from tonight. So, uh, so thank you very yeah. much for thank you guys very much. Uh, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you for joining us for our Q and A session. So we will uh, take a recess now, and the main session will resume at a quarter past eight. Yep. So see you again shortly.